Thank you, everyone. Okay, great. Okay, great. Nice see you here. later. Thank Yay. you so much. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. Welcome, everybody. Apologies for the little glitch there. Um, so welcome to our panel. Okay, so it's post-postmodernism in the post-COVID era. Um, our the organizer Frank Jordan Victor, um, you know, presented this topic. He came up with a few questions for us, namely, you know, what is the zeitgeist? What is this portent for art? Um, what is this movement happening? So, um, before we dive in, I'm going to introduce everybody, um, and also I did want to kind of put these terms in our art and culture context, right? So we can think of post postmodern has had many names. It's been around since the 90s, called ultra modern, digi modern, hyper modern, um, which all comes after postmodern, which of course is art that critiques or deconstructs modernism, art that is subjective, that is, you know, defined by self awareness, all very generally speaking. But all of our panelists today can describe much more specifically, you know, what this time after postmodern means culturally, historically, philosophically, um, and in terms of the market. Um, so our first speaker um, is going to be Boris Groys. Uh, he's a prolific scholar of philosophy, aesthetics, theory, uh, and history. Um, who's published across these disciplines. Um, some of his key art publications in specific are The Total Art of Stalinism from 1992, um, Art Power from 2008, and Going Public from 2010. And he's also a global uh, distinguished professor of Russian and Slavic studies at New York University. Um, after that, we will hear from Anne Temkin, who is the chief curator of painting and sculpture at the Museum of Modern Art. Um, where she's worked since 2003 and curated us numerous uh, major retrospectives, um, most recently Judd of 2020, um, Picasso Sculpture from 2015, uh, Robert Gover um, 2014, and Ellsworth Kelly in 2013. Um, and then after that, we will hear from Michael Klein, who's a private dealer and independent curator, um, who's worked with numerous public and private institutions, uh, including the Microsoft Art Collection, uh, which he was a curator of from 1999 to 2006, uh, and also the Michael Klein Gallery, uh, which he ran in New York from 1983 to 1997. Uh, and he's currently planning several online solo exhibitions um, by Matt Mulliken, Catherine Porter, and Rick Poole. Uh, and then finally, we will hear from Mark Porter, who is the chairman of Christie's America, um, who in over nearly 30 years um, with the company has been involved with the evolution of global art business, um, specifically online commerce, restitution, and private sales. Um, in January 2021, he began um, as a fellow at Harvard's Advanced Leadership Initiative, uh, where he joins a cohort of executives studying diversity, sustainability, and social impact. Um, so Boris, if you could kindly start us off, where do we begin thinking about this moment, the zeitgeist and, and art right now? Well, I will try, yeah. So, when we think about the uh, art of postmo uh, postmodernism, it was inspired by a feeling of no future, if you remember this time, of a kind of cultural pessimism, a loss of the utopian perspectives. So, it was a certain mood, yeah, underlying this movement. And I have a feeling that this mood has changed. So our time, at least for the younger generation of artists, is a time of technological utopianism. You see that everywhere. And also of the hopes for a social change. So this idea to change the society by the means of art is uh, very present here at the moment. So the, the whole context of art itself also has changed, or let's say shifted, um, contemporary public, at least, uh, again, it's a younger part, uh, follows the artists and art institutions primarily on the internet. And that is especially true, of course, or was especially true in the COVID time. Uh, and I think that it's, 
So at least a lot of my young, uh, the young artists, including uh, including my students, always told me they want to do something viral, something that will be viral on the internet. This idea that virus is a kind of cultural ideal, yeah? You have to become viral, yeah? Uh, I don't know how the feeling is after, after the virus got viral, yeah? Uh, are people disappointed or further fascinated by this concept of virality? In any case, more and more people uh, want to make art on the in- Instagram and look at the Instagram early uh, than going to the galleries or museums, and maybe they only look at the Instagram. And so we have also financial success of the people like people and so on and so on. And at the same time, also influence of the imagery that is produced by the new political movements, posters, street art, photography, video. And in general, uh, I find that at least a part of the, uh, I wouldn't say art community, but artistic movements today are more neo-pop. They want to be popular and they use popular images, uh, more neo-pop as postmodern or post-postmodern. At the same time, there are only a few artists who try to investigate critically and analyze this new internet culture. I could maybe mention Berliner artist, uh, Hita Steyr or Trevor Peglin, who practice this kind of analysis. But uh, most of the artists just you um, just use uh, the language of uh, of the internet uh, uh, without analyzing it specifically or mm-hmm. its structure or the algorithm that uh, operate behind this image. Mm-hmm. At the same time, of course, uh, it would be wrong uh, to think that all the important things happen on the internet. They happen also in art spaces and museums and galleries. Uh, but if you look at them, then you also see uh, a certain proliferation or growing number of uh, works that are more or less, how to say, neo futuristic, yeah, inspired uh, by also certain kind of technological utopianism. Uh, I can mention only one, maybe as an example, but this typical example is Argentinian artist Thomas Saracena, who creates models, huge models of the cities flying in heaven, reminding me at least uh, of the early project of the Russian avant-garde. And so it seems to me that in a certain way, the contemporary uh, mood, not contemporary practice of forms, but contemporary mood in a certain way, neo-avant-garde. Neo-avant-garde not because it is, let's say, very uh, uh, optimist or positive. From time to time it is, from time to time it is not. But because people, artists, feel themselves in the midst of big social and technological transformations, yeah? And they look for the place inside these transformational processes, and they look uh, in general uh, for the place of the individual inside these huge uh, processes. And that was the problematics of the avant-garde. So now we experience a second technological revolution, yeah? <laughs> so. think it's what art is doing. Mm -hmm. I think that's a really perfect segue to to what Anne and I discussed a little bit beforehand um, about the second revolution and, you know, ways to think about the avant-garde. 
So shall I take up from Boris? That's of course, great. we could just we could spend the whole session just going from um, you know your remarks. Um, and what I had thought about talking through parallels to some degree what what you've been saying, um, not discussing the technology per se, but my sense that the moment that we're in art in within art right now, whatever you call it, is one that is for the first time in probably 30 years, whether you're an artist or whether you're an institution, requiring that the values that you hold about society, about your place in history, becoming foregrounded. And it reminds me very much of this famous quotation from Philip Guston in the mid 60s when he stopped working abstractly and said something to the effect or wrote to the effect, you know, how can I be worrying about putting this red here or this blue here while our country is um, and our world is, is going through what it's going through? Mm -hmm. And I think over the last five years in particular, but even building up before that, so many artists, whether they're working, you know, with new technologies, with old technologies, have, have had a moment like that. And, and certainly speaking from the point of view of an institution, a museum, we are asking ourselves, like, you know, what in the world can we do to make more clear than ever before that the art we show, the way we show that art, absolutely transparently reflects the values we hold about why we're doing it and who we're doing it for. And it's interesting because when you say it right now, it sounds to me so obvious and so necessary but I think it's fair to say that 10 or 20 years ago, those would not have been the questions an artist was asking or a museum was asking. It would not have been, how do what seems important to me, how do the things I believe in come through to the audience from what we're deciding to show and, and how we're presenting it and how we're making an audience, a potential audience, feel that they can come to MoMA, um, whereas perhaps they may not have felt that in the past. Mm -hmm. So it's, um, you know, in what you're saying, Boris, the moment very much relies upon the technology that's newly available. And from what I'm saying is it's, this moment is very much connected to um, the historic events that have happened um, over this past five years. And, and in both cases, it, it's just had a tremendous impact that I don't think um, I feel I've seen the equivalent of, um, you know, yet in the 21st century. Thank you, Anne. Michael, do you want to... Um pick up on this thread and continue. Yeah, I, I, and again, I will apologize ahead of time for my bad internet connection. Um, I, I think I'd like to take off from what was just said. Two words popped into my head from uh, a writer whose name I'm not going to remember right now. I think Lionel Trilling, sincerity and authenticity. I think these are the mm -hmm. two things that were lacking for many years. I think the last mm -hmm. political administration, uh, this COVID has forced us to look at ourselves seriously to evaluate what our values are, what is important. I think, as Anne said, the institution is asking as our individuals. What I personally am finding fascinating is the growth and some very interesting abstract painters that I'm beginning to follow from around the world um, who really seem to be impassioned about abstraction and about the work that they want to make and the sincerity that they want the work to demonstrate and I'm impressed that this is worldwide. It's not just based on a city. And and, um, and and I talked about this, that I think it's, I think because of technology, it's global, that I can discover an artist who lives in Brighton or in Normandy 
and have a conversation with him or her, uh, whereas 40 years ago it was less likely and less possible. And today it's just a matter of turning on a machine. Mm-hmm. So I'm, I unfortunately am one of those perpetual optimists. I think that the gray clouds have a silver lining. Uh, I think we're coming into a very interesting period in our lives. I think this technology is profound in its what it, what it can do for us and how it's teaching us uh, how we will learn to use it better. But I think uh, the work that's coming out now, the things that I'm seeing are pretty remarkable. Mm-hmm. That's interesting too, because that's sort of reflective of what Boris was talking about, of artists tapping into this neo-utopian impulse that sort of re-emerged that we didn't see so much in the postmodern moment. Um, well, I think like in the Michael past Stina. we saw, I, I think we're not seeing, I don't particularly think that we're seeing artists who are rebelling against anything. I think you're seeing artists who are really deeply entrenched in attempting to identify themselves through their work uh, and to identify the feelings Um, it's interesting sitting in the quiet of a post-Trump era to not hear the hatred and a lot of the vitriol um, Mm -hmm. allows us to think and to spend some time evaluating what we want and what's important. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I remember when we chatted briefly before too, um, you brought up this idea too that space is collapsing, you know, with in terms of specifically finding artists online, um, you know, there's well, not this, just artists um, online. I I have to tell you that you know, I, my days are insane. Uh, I spent this morning at two a.m. on the phone with my business contact in Bali, and then mm-hmm. in the evening or in the early morning, I'm talking to someone in Milan. Uh, mm-hmm. The world is collapsed. It's sh- it's smaller. Um, mm-hmm. There are you know we're in touch with each other all the time. Uh, it's changed completely, and this I've noticed in the last year. I mean, since since the pandemic, we were forced to figure out new ways of communicating and doing business. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I find it glorious that I'm beginning to contact people who live in different cultures, in different parts of the world, different climates. Um, you know, and there's a there's a share in the fact that we're passionate about art. We just happen to live in different time zones. Mm-hmm think that's also the fact that you brought up the business aspect um, and working across time zones is a nice segue possibly to Mark's work, um, you know, with Christie's, um, you know, bringing auctions online. Um, but maybe you can also just speak generally um, to some of the things that have come up. Sure. I, I mean, I, I think that the elements of online commerce and digital will be explored broadly by by the people here, I I was I was struck by Anne's discussion of the the requirement of the institution to really understand what we represent and who and who we are, and from a for profit side, um, and I am probably conflating the onset of COVID and the George Floyd murder. Um, the intensity of um, demand in the most positive way I can possibly think of it from my colleagues, especially younger colleagues, to articulate for themselves and expect from the an art business what we represent was absolutely extraordinary. And this being online with them because we couldn't be in person um, facilitated communication in a rather extraordinary way that I would never have imagined before. Um, and as as Anna mentioned, I'm I'm spending this year in a in a fellowship, um, and it is is virtual rather than being in Cambridge. And I'm in in school with a a lot of students who are in their their 20s. And what is really interesting to me is how much 
they are cha- challenging um, the political and, and capital structure of the country, and also um, the the constant questioning of power and expression of power. And that's that's something I imagine that we're, we're all you're you're all seeing. I mean, you all work with the artists. We, we, I, I work on the business side of it with the consumers, with some artists now selling directly, which is definitely a, 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 tr- a transformation that happened this year. Um, but I'm, I'm very curious just to, to hear how, how, how those elements that I'm seeing in the classroom you're seeing in, in artists who are producing work now. Any immediate thoughts? A little too soon to say, mm-hmm. I think. Um, but certainly talking about co-workers or, um, yeah, students, there is no question that the, um, the mandate for change through any number of systems, all systems, is extraordinary you know, and things that we didn't question for so many years that they're just taking apart down to the core saying, why does this have to be this way? Mm -hmm. Um, We don't accept this. Mm -hmm. It's really something to see. No complacency, no, um, you know, uh, um, lack of questioning. Mm-hmm. Well, I think that the whole relationship between the writer and the public, the artist and the public, and the uh, uh, teacher and the students uh, uh, has changed. Uh, mm-hmm. Because when we speak about mass society, we're living about mass society, uh, we have this model uh, by Guy Debord, yeah, society of the spectacle. So some people create spectacle uh, for the po- passive masses, but these passive masses they do not exist anymore. Yeah, if you if speak yeah. about the uh, internet and contemporary culture in general, you see that almost everybody has a voice or has get a voice and uh, can create art. Yeah, for example, uh, putting. Uh, videos and uh, drawings and paintings and uh, photographs of the internet and films. And now when I see, for example, how my students operate when speaking about students, they, first of all, uh, not necessarily listening to me and what I'm saying. Yeah, uh, They kind of absorb everything that they get from the outside, uh, from the internet, uh, including also uh, Facebook, uh, and so on and so on. But also, they are very interested in what other students are doing, what students maybe in other institutions are doing. They are interested in the production of their own generation. Yeah? And of course, if you are confronted with such a, a creative, active, or let's say activated audience, yeah, then the question of your political position or your stand in society uh, becomes to be uh, central. Uh, as, as far as you have to do with passive audience, it's enough to be an artist or it's enough to be a writer, yeah, to get some kind of privileged position uh, in a culture of hierarchy. Uh, but now it's not enough, yeah. You, you, you have to take positions. I think that is also reason uh, for this uh, activation of the audience and kind of urgency that I think everybody feels in this. Mm. Mm. It's interesting too because they, there's sort of a parallel between what all you're saying like from the museum with Anne, it's this idea of the potential audience or the expanded audience. Um, and Boris is also talking about the activated audience, right? That we that doesn't even exist yet until uh, until we identify, you know, the artist or the artist expands beyond 
um, their immediate perspective. I think Anne used a really interesting word when we were chatting beforehand too of, of neutrality, right? That um, she said, it, you know, we're starting to realize it's not enough for art to be neutral, um, which I think is an interesting word. I'm curious, you know, um, whether you, Boris or Mark, whether that also connects to, you know, this new era and also this, these utopian desires and impulses. Mm. Um, I, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll try to answer that. Um, just in an experience that I had, we had this this week um, in in selling a, a digital pure a, a work of art that is yeah. that exists only in the digital realm. Um, we had twenty two million people watch the mm. sale. Um, mm. It's 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 a community that we never understood as an audience. And in this, I, I think about Anne's, Anne's work, and the, the work of cultural institutions, that there are hundreds of millions of people there that we might not have imagined as a, actually potentially involved in, in what our enterprises are. And that's been a, that, that's, that was a, a, a quite a shock. Um, mm -hmm. that, and and I and I find it very optimistic um, in that it 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 means that there are a hundred hundreds of millions of people who are interested in what might be presented and um, while hearing your the 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 aspect of non filtering and everybody having a voice there and while whatever system of power or structure will ultimately be created there there i think there will be an aggregator of sorts of 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 artists and it's probably where Anne's work will will take them take the museum <laughs> I think that the NFT is very fascinating, right? This this um, sale of a digital work too, because they, I'm curious where, you know, because it, it exists too as a this very hot market potential, right? It was a very spectacular sale and everyone is wrapped with attention. And I'm curious where that might get folded back into aesthetics, you know, where artists might be thinking about that or, um, you know, how you guys might envision artists responding um, to that. Well, I think that <laughs> a great problem was, of course, the problem of, uh, uh, there was a certain uh, promise in art, it is a promise of secular, or uh, material immortality, yeah, that uh, things will be kept and restored and uh, maintained uh, as institutions like MoMA. Mm -hmm. And so uh, internet was a promise of uh, success here and now, but somehow undermined the uh, promise of uh, a relative immortality, not real immortal, but relative immortality. And I think what, what, what was the success of people and this uh, Bitcoin uh, idea was, of course, the renewal of this promise. Yes, I think that, yeah. that, was, uh, that was seductive uh, for everybody. That was seductive also for me. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm curious how how you interpret it from a more historical or aesthetic perspective. This, you know, a work that's created, sold, and exhibited digitally. Well, obviously, it absolutely challenges all of the things that museums, um, you know, were set up to address and um, take care of. So. I think it's an open question. Do museums through departments of, of digital art or, or, you know, whatever they may grow to encompass that actually end up um, being able to embrace this realm that's, you know, the opposite of, of really everything we're based on, which is that there are things that we 
take care of. Um, and, um, you know, there couldn't, there couldn't be an answer yet. Um, none of us has a crystal ball for whatever it may be, 10, 20, 50 years from now. Um, if at some level, this next um, category or territory, you know, is, is one that um, gets taken up or that just starts some whole new direction um, that goes beyond the analog museum, essentially, as, as the place where it resides, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the physical mm -hmm. museum. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because in, in a sense, that may be a completely inappropriate um, partner. Mm. Yeah. 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 Boris is word of the more material immortality reminds us too that MoMA as an educational institution is essential for an artist like Beeple to even create, you know, all of his work, um, you know, is derivative in some sense of what we think of as art, as images. So in a way they, they need one another, I think. It's not as discontinuous as it may seem. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I wanted to ask Anne whether she ag agrees with those those early opinions that some people have placed his work in the, the sort of Duchampian sense, and in that, and in that way, is very much connected with what we know. Well, though, of course, um, you know what comes to mind is Duchamp said that the great artist of tomorrow will go underground, and this certainly is anything but underground. <laughs> um, Interesting. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't. Um, I don't know what I, I would say to that. Certainly in terms of the connection people are making to Duchamp, I can guess that it has to do with the non-visibility and non-tangibility, right? Um, being associated uh, necessarily with a work of art. But um, yeah, hard for me to say. Mm. Wouldn't have come to my mind as, as yeah. the link. I think that Duchamp uh, played with the relationship between a profane outside space and the space of the museum. So he more or less uh, associated the museum space with this kind of privileged space of education, if you want, and immortality and keeping mm -hmm. things beautiful. Here, it's interesting that the framework that has changed as Anne said. It's, it's a different kind of museum, it's a different concept of museum and different promise of museum. And it, uh, I agree, it's an uh, open question if this promise uh, will be realized or not, but the promise itself is interesting. It's a different kind of promise. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right, Maybe I mean, more. it go it goes back to what you were saying about um, the new role of the teacher or the writer, you know, no more like mm -hmm. the authority. And so much of the history of the museum was depending on the authority of the connoisseur or, or the historian, whereas this feels um, not necessarily that that's where it's drawing its um, um, uh, you know, authority, its own authority. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It, you know, very parallel, I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sounds a bit what Mark is getting at too is um, it's a similar type of dislocation and, and Anne picked that up um, with what Boris was saying about the changing of roles, right? And maybe with this accelerated climate we're now in, this dislocation perhaps is happening faster. Um, you know, a sale like people can um, gain traction more quickly um, and maybe there will be more artists of his, you know, of this kind. Um, are there, so we, I'm getting an alert that we're at five, <laughs> but I want to give a chance um, for everybody to have some, some closing remarks before we end. Should we go in the and, same order? Sure. <laughs> 
Okay, uh, so this is the same order. Uh, 